Well, welcome. My name is Jody Scholes. I am your instructor uh, for the MBLEX Review course. This, we are independently organized, and I am bringing you the best uh, information about how to pass your test. We do that in three parts, and we go through three parts each week. Uh, the majority of what we do is in part two, but part one is learning a little bit about the test understanding maybe some of the folklore, the things that you've been, the feedback that you've been getting uh, from people who are taking the test. Um, so we go through what actually is the MBLEX review course. Then uh, the second part, part two of our class is we dive in and do some really good um, learning. And today we're talking about pathology and I've got a ton of stuff for you. So we're gonna get right to it. Um, and then the last part is we're going to dissect some questions. And this gets you using your nugget. This gets you using your brain. Um, all right, let's see. Do, do, do. Got a bunch of people still coming in, uh, and that's cool. So best practices, if you could, uh, go ahead and mute your phone or mute uh, your um, your computer. Uh, and that way we get a nice, clean copy. Samantha, I got you. Uh, so, yes. All right. So what type of test is the MBLEX? Let's spend two minutes on that. I'm going to jump into our pathology topic and dissect some questions. Um, we have quite a bit of material. So I want to simply remind you that the MBLEX is a computer adaptive test, a CAT. And for those of you who are with me in the patron community, I'm gonna post this afternoon, uh, not only this recording, but I'll also post the recording that was, that was made by the Federation about what is a CAT type of test, computer adaptive test, C-A-T, CAT test. That means that this test is going to adapt to your skill level. And so I like to explain it that you're gonna start in the middle. You're gonna start with, if this is hard and this is easy, you're gonna start with an average difficulty question. If you get that question correct, when you get it correct, the next question is gonna be a little bit more difficult. Get that correct, it's gonna be a little bit more difficult. That correct, it's gonna be a little bit more difficult. Now, that seems mean. That seems like you're out to get me. <laughs> it's not. Because when those questions get more difficult, you actually earn more points. Yes, so answering difficult questions correctly gets you more points. And your whole goal is to score uh, 630 points in this test. Now we don't know how much each point, each um, question is worth, but you're gonna get 100 questions, right? And your goal is to score 630 points. So basically a 63, right? If it's 100, you know, and we were doing one point per question, that would be just getting 63 of those questions right. On my practice exam, you gotta get a 70 to pass. Yeah, so if you're scoring a 63 or better, you're actually passing the MBLEX. But back to this computer adaptive test, if you get this kind of sort of hard question, medium difficulty question wrong, the next question will be easier. So this test is actually conspiring to get you into a rhythm, to get you some momentum. So when you're there, remember, I just wanna remind you, please breathe while you're there. Breathe, 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 okay? Um, it is uh, a test, it, can, it is going to make you nervous. Thinking about it makes, it makes you nervous. It's okay, that's normal. It actually kicks in our endocrine system and gives us some epinephrine to actually be creatively thinking, to be critically thinking. And when we cover the endocrine system, you'll remember what those hormones do uh, in, the, uh, in the system. They help you to take fight or flight, but it makes you a great critical thinker. So that little bit of nervousness is actually helping too. I know, right? So you are in a great position to go ahead and take this exam. Let's talk about next, going into part two, let's go into our pathology for the day. All right, let me do this. Thank you for your patience. Oh, I gotta share the screen, otherwise you can't see. 
All right. Whoop. That was not it. Thanks for your patience. Uh, la, la, la. All right. There we go. Welcome back. Welcome back. We are covering pathology today. So pathology for massage therapists. Let me move us out of the way. Um, we have done another class on pathology um, like uh, about 12 weeks ago. Um, so this is uh, a mix of some material you've reviewed in school and some material you may not have seen. However, we're approaching this pathology from the lens of a massage therapist and from the lens of the MPLEX. What are we gonna need to know to safely practice massage therapy as far as pathology is concerned? So we're gonna identify about 10 to 12, we'll see what we get through today, uh, different pathologies. And pathology is just a fancy way to say a disease or a condition. Okay, uh, so that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to talk about symptoms. We're going to talk about session adaptations. Um, and then we're going to dissect some questions at the end on this. So here's what we're going to cover today. We're going to talk about uh, tendon disorders. We're going to talk about uh, whiplash. We're going to cover sprains and strains. Uh, where strains versus sprains. Uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, we're going to talk about myofascial pain syndrome as it compares to fibromyalgia, uh, and some, we're going to cover postural deviations, and we're going to talk about thoracic outlet syndrome. <laughs> so uh, it, yeah, that's like alphabet soup, right? Um, but work with me, you're going to feel so confident when we get done. If you don't know what some of this stuff is, don't worry. Um, you will by the time we get done. And I'll bet you, you'll be like, oh yeah, I remember. Oh, and just when you're reviewing this later, here's other conditions. If you want to dive deeper into pathology, here's other conditions that I would recommend that you are familiar with. Um, plantar fasciitis, uh, both osteo and rheumatoid arthritis, uh, hypertension, so high blood pressure, uh, TMJ, the causes of TMJ pain, uh, skin diseases we've talked about, eczema and psoriasis. Uh, look at, if you don't know what torticollis is, look it up, and adhesive capillitis, that's also a good one. So we're not going to talk about those today, maybe in the next eight-week segment uh, when we get started again in September. All right, but let's talk about tendon disorders. Oh boy, now this is a fancy way to talk about things like Achilles tendonitis. It's a tendon disorder. So Achilles tendonitis, uh, tennis elbow, golfer's elbow. And then we're gonna take a brief look at the difference between tendonitis and tendinosis. Because when you're treating your clients, you're gonna to wanna to know, is this truly tendonitis or is it tendinosis? And look here, guys, the difference in the spelling, okay? Cover more on this in a minute or in four minutes. All right, let's, talk, let's take a look at Achilles tendonitis. Where is it? So in fact, I'm gonna cover that slide. Where is your Achilles tendon? Touch it. If you're not driving or if it's safe to do so, touch your Achilles tendon. Yeah, cross your ankle over your knee, and it's at the distal end of the soleus. So find it on your own body. You see it here in the image. The Achilles tendon is right here at the distal end of the soleus, okay? And itis, I-T-I-S, inflammation. So it's inflammation of the Achilles tendon. Uh, the way we treat it is we work both the tendon, if it's not acutely um, inflamed. Um, if, so if it's not currently inflamed, we can go ahead and treat the Achilles tendon. But we also want to retreat the reciprocal muscle, which is the posterior tibialis. You're getting a tiny little bit of sports massage here uh, in your treatment plan. This will not be on the Amblex. Um, but I just wanted to remind you of the concept of reciprocal muscles. Uh, reciprocal muscles have to do with like your bicep and your tricep. 
your rectus abdominis, right? And your quadratus lumborum. So the antagonist and protagonist is another way to say that. Um, but reciprocal muscles, one that you can't have work both the bicep and the tricep at the same time, right? They can't be activated at the same time. That's a reciprocal muscle group. In your leg, what is the reciprocal muscle of the hamstrings? If you were going to guess, what's the reciprocal muscle of the hamstrings? Mm -hmm. You can put it in the chat. Bingo, yes. Oh, good job, good job, good job. Yes, Riva, yes, Lynn, yes, Alicia, yes. All right. Okay. Oh, hey, good. I'm glad to see you, Namika. Hi. All right. Yes, the quads. The quads are the reciprocal muscle group of the hamstrings, front and back, right? And so when we look at the soleus and treating the Achilles tendon, the soleus turns into the Achilles tendon. The reciprocal muscle of that is the posterior tibialis. Thank you. Moving along, let's review tennis elbow and golfer's elbow. Where do people feel tennis elbow? Let's take a look. Tennis elbow is actually the lateral epicondyle. So lateral, we are in anatomical position, right? So in anatomical position, we stand with our hands thumb out, right? So if we're standing, we're standing thumbs out. And so where is lateral? Lateral epicondylitis. So on the outside, the pinky side of the elbow. That is where lateral epicondylitis occurs. So that's another way for to say tennis elbow is lateral epicondylitis. All right. So, and the lateral epicondyle is a bony landmark. It's the attachment point. So if we feel tennis elbow in our lateral epicondyle, where do we experience golfer's elbow? Yes, in the medial epicondyle, right? So lateral, medial. So, and that's the medial epicondyle in anatomical position. Also golfer's elbow technically could be called medial epicondylitis. Now, of course, both lateral and medial epicondylitis are not limited to tennis and golf. Um, those can be conditions from overuse as well. Treatment for golfer's elbow, cross fiber friction, ice, um, and, um, and rest is usually the, the most effective treatment for golfer's elbow. For us, cross fiber friction, sure, stimulate that. Also some flushing. But here's the root of tendon disorders, okay? It's tendinitis versus tendinosis. And so, this segment of our class today is going to demonstrate uh, some research, some share with you some research from the International Journal of Massage and Body Work. It's referenced on your screen right here. Um, and this is a lovely resource if you're treating a client um, to use uh, for options on treatment. Tendonitis is the itis. Osis is different. It's, oh no. Itis is like arthritis, bursitis. Um, the itis, you think inflammation, okay? Pain, burning in the effective area. Um, there's going to be some uh, loss of strength. Um, you're going to notice it in everyday activities. Tendinitis is different than tendinosis. And oddly enough, of the two, tendinosis is more common. Let's distinguish them. The, the reason we want to distinguish between these two is because the treatment is really different. And so this is pathology, session adaptations, 
as it relates to the emblex, what are we going, what do we identify with tendinitis versus tendinosis? Itis is inflammation of the tendon, micro tears. And if you'll notice here, it is acute. That means that it's active. It is happening right now. It is maybe new. It's inflamed. So in this tendinitis, something has happened. There's been an event. There's been um, finally, you know, all of that tennis, all of that golf created enough micro tears to create um, some tendinitis. Now, micro tears aren't always bad because when we weight lift, we create micro tears, right? So that gives us that kind of, oh, I'm sore, I worked out yesterday. Those are actually little micro tears that demonstrates we're building muscle, we're thickening the muscle. But in this case, there's inflammation. So uh, even though this is a very common diagnosis, tendinitis, and your clients might tell you they have tendinitis, we need to we need to know we need to dig down a little different tendinosis is chronic so here we see tendinitis is acute it's happening right now there's inflammation tendinosis is a condition that is chronic it's happened over time so that's why i say oh no tendinosis like oh no mr bill i'm dating myself oh no tendinosis Tendinosis is chronic. Oh, chronic. There's an O in chronic. Tendinosis. Tendinitis, it's acute. Tendinosis, O, O, O. Chronic overuse. Oh, no. So, and this does not have to be from big movements, as it says in the slide here, even just clicking a mouse can cause some tendinosis. But tendinosis is a thickening of the tendon. Itis, micro tears. Osis, thickening of the tendon. And it's a very different treatment. It's a thickening of the tendon because of overuse, because of a repetitive strain. So the most, so what we're trying to do here with, let me get out of, us out of the way here so you can see the slide. The most, so we're determined, seeing the differences so that we can determine the proper treatment. And again, as it relates to the emblex, you'll want to pay attention if they're asking about itis or osis, tendinitis or tendinosis. When we're treating tendinitis, we want to get rid of inflammation. So that could be ice, you know. But when we're treating tendinosis, We want to break that cycle of injury. So there's been a thickening of the tendon due to prolonged chronic overuse. And so we want to treat that in such a way that's, that's going to break up some of that tissue. So itis, inflammation, tendinosis, chronic overuse, thickening of the tendon. We need to know if it's acute or chronic because some of the treatments for treating inflammation, some of the treatments for tendinitis are contraindicated for tendinosis. For example, um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, otherwise known as NSAIDs. So NSAID, non-steroidal, NS, anti-inflammatory drugs. Some of those are associated with not allowing the collagen to repair. Also, when someone says, oh, you know, I'm gonna, um, I've got this tendinitis. I've got this tendinitis. I'm actually gonna go get a steroid injection. Well, steroid injections also inhibit collagen repair, tendon repair. Who knew, right? So if it is tendinosis, we don't wanna take an, um, and said, we don't want a steroid injection. Also, well, you can see here from the side, sometimes with those uh, steroid injections, those can be a predictor of later tears. All right, so we must know if it's acute or chronic. What is acute? What is chronic?
Ooh, got some answers going on here. Yes, lateral is the pinky, indeed. Yep. Lateral is the pinky. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, use heat. Yes. All right, for now to chronic and acute. Mm -hmm. Acute is happening now. Yes, exactly. It is, it's, it's happening right now. So we need to be very careful with acute injuries or acute conditions. Chronic. Yes. Yeah, you got this. Acute is now. Yes. Thank you, Namika. I know, I know who you are now. <laughs> uh, good. Acute long-term. Yes. Chronic is now. Excuse me. Acute is now. Chronic is long-term. That is correct. Long-term happens over time. Long-term. Yes, yes, yes. Good. And you'll see here, Acute, it just happened. We normally know there's some event that's caused it. Um, recent onset, it's new. This person has never had it before. Chronic, it usually comes and goes, right? Um, it's been kind of a long-term problem or an ongoing problem. It's not new. Good job. All right, let's move from tendinosis and tendinitis to our next pathology. Whiplash, whiplash. Mm, what do you do when someone comes in and they want a massage and they say, oh, I think I might have whiplash. Well, let's say, what is it? It's a neck injury and it's in the sagittal plane. So it's in that uh, plane that divides us in half, right? So it's in a, an injury where the head has then pushed forward and slapped back. And where do we normally see this injury occur? What do we, you know, where, what do you normally, with, with your experience? Yeah, exactly. Good, Lynn, get a good doctor's clearance. Jessica, 72 hours. Yes, exactly. Good you chowing in, Jessica. Good for you. All right. Um, so where do we normally see whiplash injuries? Yes, scalenes. Um, and what has caused it? Oftentimes, what has caused a whiplash? Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Good, Reva. Car wreck. Alicia, yes, car accident. Yes. In fact, most rear end accidents create a force where the head goes forward and then we flip it back. So we need to be, it can be the result of, um, like in soccer, boom. You know, uh, you know, they get hit in the head and that can cause their head to snap back. Um, but typically it's a rear end car accident. And it's important for us to know this because it's actually contraindicated to work on the person for 72 hours. Why would that be? I will give you, I'll give you a hint. It has to do with our physical, with our, with our, uh, with our endocrine system. Mm -hmm. What's happening right after an accident or right after we get a whack to the head? Mm -hmm. So what's happening in our endocrine system, it thinks we're being attacked. And so there's a fight or flight response. And so with that fight or flight response, boom, we think, oh my God, I'm gonna have to lift this car off a child. And all of a sudden you've got this adrenaline rushing through your body, like, holy mackerel, what just happened? Bingo, Alicia nailed it. Uh, there still could be adrenaline in their system up to 72 hours afterwards. How many times have we um, heard the story of someone who was in an accident, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And then the next morning they wake up and they're like, oh my gosh, my neck is so stiff. That's because the adrenaline in their system was masking the actual pain. That's why it's important for us to wait 72 hours or get a doctor's note that they've been cleared of whiplash. All right. Let's move along, cover a lot of ground here today. Hang on, hang on. 
So the difference between sprains and strains. Let's take a look. Sprains and strains. A sprain affects the ligament. So we sprain a ligament. That's a term you may have heard before. Oh, they sprain. Yes, exactly. You got it, Sharla. So what is a ligament? It's that tough band of fibrous tissue that connects a bone to a bone. So most often we see a sprain of the ankle, but if you wanted, um, yeah, and we're gonna talk about that kind of sprain. A strain affects the tendon, so a muscle or a tendon. So T, the letter T is in the word strain, right? T for tendon. Yes. So T for tendon. Straining a tendon or straining a muscle. And you can see the difference in the strain because when you strain, see the image here, a lot of times what happens when you strain a muscle, you might feel a pop, you might um, hear something, um, but it's a stretching or a, a or a, a a kind of tearing, if you will, not a severing, um, but a, 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 an occurrence in that tendon or in the muscle. And rem a reminder that the tendons attach muscles to bones. Right on. Ooh, is someone having connection issues? Okay. All right, thanks Lynn for chiming in. Um, I did admit your phone, so feel free to give that a try. All right, thanks for checking in you guys. One more quick little look at this, sprains and strains, just to remind you, sprain, you sprain a ligament. So when there's an ankle sprain, think about your ankle, right? Not a lot of muscles or tendons down there. So it's mostly ligaments attaching bone to bone, sprains. Strains with a T you're, is affecting the tendon or the muscle. And we'll sometimes see this discoloration where there's been a strain to the muscle. Ligaments are not very vascular. That's why this doesn't happen. So there's not a lot of blood in ligaments compared to a muscle or a tendon, right? So um, that's why we see the bruising action uh, in a strain. Okie dokie, carpal tunnel syndrome. We are all over the body today. Carpal tunnel syndrome. Where do they feel it? Where is your carpal tunnel? Mm hmm. Come on. I uh, see some answers coming in. Boom, boom, boom. Yes. Nice job, Sharla. Oh, you all got it. Look at you. Uh, great, Reva. Yes. Um, be more specific, please. That's where you feel the pain. Uh, Alicia, yes. Sharla, yes. Raquel, yes. Uh, Namika, yes. It's in the wrist, right? So carpal tunnel is right here. I'm touching my wrist if you can't see me. So it is a condition that causes numbness, tingling, and other symptoms in sometimes the, the arm, in the lower arm, in the distal, and, but mostly in the hand. Sometimes the area of numbness are these first three fingers, most likely. Now I will tell you that the, these two fingers, the fourth and the fifth finger, usually that's a result of compression on C7. So, but the first three carpal tunnel syndrome is usually affecting um, numbness and tingling in these areas. And if you can see from our image here, you'll see the carpal ligament. Hmm. The car is that a better picture? There's a better picture. All right, let's take a look at this picture. Carpal ligament. So that is, it's almost like a watch band. So if you had a watch on, it would be the band where the band would, would hold that watch on. So right here, the carpal ligament. And this ligament creates a creates a kind of tunnel. So it's like the bridge over this tunnel. So the carpal tunnel is where our carpal bones live, right? It's also where the median nerve passes through. 
So when this ligament becomes tight, it squishes together, it reduces the space in the carpal tunnel, and that's why that compression creates the pain and tingling. The compression of the nine bones that are in our wrist create, when that's compressed and squished together because this ligament has shortened. So say we're typing, 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 typing. That can cause that ligament to shorten. And that's what compresses the tunnel, creating the pain and tingling. So treatments for carpal tunnel, obviously massage therapy and massage therapy. Well, I say obviously, but it's not obvious to everyone. Not every hand doctor recommends massage therapy, but my experience has been that massage therapy is very effective on warming up and lengthening the carpal ligament. Yes, the retinaculum of the wrist. Thank you, thank you, Lynn. Exactly. So different treatments are prescribed, but as a massage therapist, you can um, be confident in treating the wrist. And this is, a, this is a little twist, you guys. This is really specific, right? This isn't the long gliding effleurage strokes. This is friction. It's specific. You're getting in there. You're finding these little bones. You're finding that carpal ligament and you're warming it up. And what happens when we warm up a ligament? It can stretch. One of the recommended treatments is to actually perform hand and wrist stretching exercises. So that would be hand and wrist. And these are lovely for a massage therapist too, right? Try that on yourself if you're not driving your car. Lovely stretch. Um, some doctors will re uh, recommend immobilization. Not great, but it can reduce the inflammation, right? Because it's um, this carpal tunnel syndrome is, um, if it has to do with an inflammatory condition, this is actually a shortening, a tightening of the muscle. It's not necessarily inflammation. There could be some in there, uh, but it's mostly inflammation of the nerves that run through at those first three fingers. So wearing a, a wrist brace at night can make it feel better because it can help those nerves to calm down, but it's not really treating the cause. All right, hand and wrist exercises, modify your activities, modify how much you type, um, learn better habits, get a little, um, a little brace for your computer to, to make your hands go from like this to like this. Um, also, uh, hand uh, doctors will uh, have their patients consider a cortisone shot um, or surgery. Um, but what happens with surgery? Surgery, they cut, right? Almost immediate relief. But what happens, what, what does our body have to do after we have surgery and we cut? We have to heal, right? And so when we cut through the ligament, <laughs> We have to heal and sometimes scar tissue forms. And scar tissue takes up some room in that carpal tunnel. And so it can actually, that scarring can sometimes cause another occurrence of carpal tunnel. So if you're working with a client who's already had surgery, wait the appropriate amount of time and then mobilize the scar. Just make sure it's moving. All right. Back to our pathologies. Let's take a look at where, how are we on time? Good on time. All right, good. Uh, let's take a look at myofascial pain syndrome and fibromyalgia and how they're related and not related. All right, so myofascial pain syndrome is a condition that is diagnosed by a doctor we do not diagnose, we do not prescribe. We do not say, oh, I think you have, um, yeah, um, I think you have myofascial pain syndrome. No. In fact, 
we just, we don't diagnose. Okay. And, and in that case, we, we need to use language that says, in my opinion, based on my experience, based on my expertise, here's what I think it might be. But it's, it's doctors who diagnose, it's doctors who prescribe. So myofascial pain syndrome has some characteristics um, that are similar to fibromyalgia, but different. Pain is normally lopsided. It's, um, it's got a focal point, it's like, ah, oh, you know, my whole arm hurts. This whole arm hurts. It's unbalanced, it's uneven. That's a big difference with myofascial pain syndrome. There's a focal point, but it's uneven. Myofascial pain syndrome and fibro can coexist. They're not the same. Fibromyalgia is specifically about certain pain points. You'll see them um, in, if you're looking at the, uh, at the video, you'll see these 18 different points that have been identified as tender spots for fibromyalgia. And the difference is they come in pairs. So this is a pain pattern that's symmetrical. Fibro is symmetrical with pain points. Myofascial pain syndrome, spasm, tenderness, which fibro can have, but symmetrically. Myofascial pain syndrome, typically lopsided. In general, fibromyalgia is a condition mostly found in women, but in some men, of hypersensitivity uh, in these pain points. So just even a touch. Now, oddly enough, massage therapy is one of the few treatments that benefits fibromyalgia almost every time. 99% of the time, the client will be feeling better after their massage if they have come in with fibromyalgia. It is a consistent treatment that really helps. So American College of Rheumatology says you'll have fibro if you have at least 11 of the or 10 of the 18 tender points. Um, they're, they're painful to touch. And again, massage therapy is one of the few treatments that consistently helps. All right, we're getting closer to our dissecting of the questions, but we've got a couple more pathologies to cover. All right. Some of these words you haven't heard before. Okay, postural deviations. Postural what? Yeah, so this is postural deviations. This is changes to the spine that creates a difference in posture. And everybody's normal posture is a little different. So take a look at your own posture right now. Bring your shoulders back, your shoulder blades down, sternum forward. Imagine a string on the top of your head, elevating, elevating you ever so slightly. This is neutral posture for you. And it might look very different on you than it does on a client. This is part of our critical thinking. This is a part of our assessment. These are tools in our assessment. Let's look at some common postural deviations. Now in this slide, it says problems, but we are calling it deviations, okay? Uh, so we've got an ideal posture, which is neutral. The sway back um, is kind of, well, I think I cover these in the slides. Let's go, let's go, um, let's go through these. So ideal posture is different for everybody. Well, I do not have individual pictures of these. So sway back is also when it's like, if you've seen the pictures of the old men who like pull their, uh, their, their belts up to over their belly button and their, their pelvis is kind of tucked under and they walk with it kind of tucked under. That is a condition that's also called a 
posterior tilt to the pelvis. There's more on that in another lesson, but we're just going how it affects the posture, postural deviations. Military back is called also called um, a flat back. Those are similar. What I'd like you to pay attention to though is the kyphotic and lordotic curves. So in this image, it's the fifth skeleton and you can see the kyphotic curve is like the humpback, right? So when we see older women and they've got that great big thoracic curve, that's also called a kyphotic curve a kyphosis of the spine. If we look at the lumbar region, a lordotic curve, a deep lordotic curve would be an exaggerated curve of the lumbar. So your butt is sticking out. Stomach is spilling forward, butt sticking out, also an anterior tilt to the pelvis. So kyphotic curve, Lordotic covers the thoracic region, lordotic curve, L for lumbar, L for lordotic. And then these postural deviations end up creating a forward head posture. They can. So just re-familiarizing you with some of these postural deviations. And if you see them in a client, there will be some session adaptations you'd want to make, right? a strong kyphotic curve, they may need a pillow. Big lordotic curve, make sure there's a, um, a bolster under their knees. So this takes the postural deviation, puts it into your critical thinking, your logical thinking, and says, how am I going to treat this client? What is gonna be tight? What is going to be Short, so tight means short. Tight can also be overstretched. Think again about that kyphotic curve. That's gonna be overstretched, right? But it's gonna be tight. So don't always be careful of making the mistake that you think tight is short. Tight can sometimes be overstretched. All right, our last topic before the questions. Lord have mercy, thoracic outlet syndrome. What is it? Okay, let's take a peek. Thoracic outlet syndrome, um, it happens in our thoracic outlet. So it's not in our thoracic spine. There's a thoracic outlet right here between the collarbone, the clavicle, and our first rib. So that's the thoracic outlet. And that syndrome, thoracic outlet is syndrome, is when the nerves that pass through this area are compressed. The pain can go up into the shoulder, up the side of the neck, and it can also travel down into the fingers. What causes thoracic, thoracic outlet syndrome? Well, it can be from an accident. Um, you know, anything that would compress, like sleeping on your shoulder, um, having an injury. Uh, some people have an extra rib. Some people get it when they're pregnant because everything gets jammed. Um, and sometimes doctors can't figure out what causes it. Um, but what we do know is when those blood vessels and those nerves are compressed, compressed in between the clavicle and the first rib. So we know where it is, thoracic outlet syndrome, clavicle first rib. So we're here, we're in the front and it's affecting the nerve endings going down your arm. Oh, we're now, on. no, no break. Okay, I thought we were gonna have like a little break. This is the last condition before we go into our questions, dissecting our questions. Ready to change gears? Ready to take this great knowledge, this newfound and newly remembered knowledge into some questions? 
Let's do it. Part three. Tendinitis is different than tendinosis because A, tendinitis is chronic and tendinosis is acute. B, tendinosis is a thickening of the tendon. Tendinitis is a thickening of the tendon. Tendinosis is another name for carpal tunnel syndrome. What are our test taking strategies? Understand the question. How is tendinitis different than tendinosis? Ooh, we got some answers coming in. <coughs> Excuse me. So is tendinitis chronic? Let's see if we can eliminate two wrong answers. Oh, I like it. Alicia is saying, take out C. Tendinitis, itis, right, is a thickening of the tendon, right? Nope, that is not the case, correct? Good. Can eliminate A and D. Oh, eliminate A and D. I see these coming in. Thank you, Sharla. Thank you, Shatrice. Reva's already, already taken up her answer. All right, let's see. So how tendonitis is different than osis because, okay, we're taking out letter C. We're taking out D. All right, let's take a look. We got A and B left. Some of you already eliminated A. Tendonitis is chronic. Tendinosis is acute. Tendinosis is a thickening of the tendon. What you got? What do you think? Yes, C and D are wrong. Correct. Taking out A. All right, final answer. Final answer. Ready, ready, ready? Boom, boom, boom. Charlotte's in. The jury's in. I know, Lynn, I know you got this. Good, Alicia. Good, Chatrice. Yes. And our next slide tells us, boom, B. Tendinitis is different than tendinosis because of B. Tendinosis is a thickening of the tendon. And you see how each of these A, C, and D were maybe a little confusing, but they were wrong. Tendinitis isn't chronic. Can it be? It's not defined as chronic. Great. Tendinitis isn't a thickening of the tendon, it's micro tears. And tendinosis is not another name for carpal tunnel syndrome. Good job, ladies. Good job, gentlemen. All right. Carpal tunnel syndrome. Treatments include all but. All right, let's use our test taking strategy. Carpal tunnel syndrome includes. Treatments include all but A, hand and wrist exercises, B, massage therapy on the carpal ligament, C, icing the affected wrist, D, surgery. So look at the question. It's asked in the reverse. It's not asking what are treatments. It says all of these are treatments, but one is not. Okay. Ha ha ha. Oh, you guys are all slow down, slow down, slow down. <laughs> Look at the question. Let's come back to the question. I'm going to tell you the answers that just came up. Um, let's take a look. All right. So, carpal tunnel syndrome treatments include all but how we're going to say, we're going to reword this question. All of these, all of these treatments treat carpal tunnel, but one, but one does not. So these are recommended treatments for carpal tunnel, but there's one in there that's not. See how that question is different? Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. I know. I know. Tricky. But this is going to happen sometimes on the MLEX. You've got to make sure that you're understanding what this question is asking. So all of these are treatments, but one is not. What is not one, A, B, C, or D, that is not the recommended treatment? Ooh, now you're going. Yep. Namika's in. Shatrice is in. Reva's in. I know, I know Charlotte. I know you got this. I know, yeah. Yep, yep, exactly. Now you see, see how that was a little tricky? Let's see. 
Yes, okay. <laughs> All right, let me see it, yes. So take a look, here you go. Here's your answer, letter C. Icing the affected wrist is not a recommended treatment. Possibly it could reduce the inflammation in, in the nerves that are affected um, in, these, in these nerves, uh, excuse me, these three fingers here, but you're not treating the cause, right? So that's like immobilization is one of the recommended treatments. Icing is not. And this is a good time to remind you that rice, R-I-C-E, remember this? I'm going to put it in the, yeah, I know, Nika. That's tricky. That's why I'm here for you. Um, all right. Remember this, rice, R-I-C-E? Do you remember what it stands for? Who remembers? <laughs> R. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Shout it out. Feel free. Turn on your mics. Let me know. You got five minutes together until we're uh, going to be done with the lesson. I'm going to hang out afterwards. It's rest, oh, yeah. ice, compression, elevation. Yes, exactly. And the man who came up with this now, uh, about uh, two, three years ago, said he was completely wrong. Huh. Aren't they oh. adding a P now or something? It, I'd have to look, to be honest with you. But the rice, as far as icing an injury, is actually completely wrong. Huh. Our body needs the inflammation to send a signal to our brain that there's been an injury. When we ice and we eliminate the inflammation, our body may shut off the healing response. Isn't that fascinating? I look at it as the anesthetic perspective though. It, it, mm -hmm. it makes it less painful. Well, and certainly if you've got an acute situation, you know, yeah. you, and you know, and you need to, and sometimes we need to ice, you know, a body to bring down the temperature, but think about fever. What is fever doing? Mm -hmm. Fever is fighting an infection, right? Mm -hmm. Fever is systemic. Even though we, we take temperatures here, we typically take temperatures here, but on a baby, you take a temperature maybe from the forehead, but from under the tongue and maybe in the butt because the fever is systemic. Yeah, so just my point here um, as we go to our last question is um, that rice, they even say rest. Yeah, if you've got like an open wound, don't go running on it. You know, if you've just rolled your ankle, you know, don't, don't exacerbate, make worse the condition through too much force. But they're finding even rest sometimes is not the best option. So in any case, just to let you know that that science is still emerging, but it is, rice is no longer. It's good to know rest, ice, compression, elevation, but that no longer is the industry standard. Isn't it All right. Mm -hmm. Mice or something, movement, or there's, it has a different name now. It's yes. heat, sometimes ice, depending on, you know, the inflammation of it, and then mm -hmm. compression and elevation. Mm -hmm. Meat. It might be meat. Meat. Oh, that's that. Yeah. Movement. Yeah. We'll, we'll take a look at that. I'll do yeah. some homework on that and I'll uh, post it in the patron site. Uh, I'll also uh, put it in the description. All right. Let's do our last question and then we're done. We are almost done. All right. A kyphotic curve affects what part of the spine? We totally understand the question, right? A kyphotic curve. You may not have thought of the word kyphotic before today in a long time. It may have been a long time since you thought of a kyphotic curve, but what part of the spine? So A, cervical, B, thoracic. Oh, look at this. C, lumbar, D, both thoracic and lumbar. Take out A and C. I like, I like this. Take out A and C. I, I see some answers coming in. Yes, Lynn, you are on point. It could be me. Yeah, Alicia, we'll have to look that up. Take out C and A. Yes, yes, yes. Good, good. Excellent. All right, final answer. Kyphotic. Yep. It means that that kyphotic curve, remember? Yes, Jessica. Yes. Yes, Namika, A and C are out. All right, so A and C are out, which immediately eliminates D. And so the answer is... 
boom, the thoracic spine. You guys knew that. I know you knew that. But I'm glad it's now back in the front of your mind um, versus tucked away and hidden in a file. All right, here's our students studying. Oh my God, how am I gonna remember everything? <laughs> you may be feeling a little bit like that after a class like this. Um, this is meant to be a brief overview uh, of these conditions. Uh, and it could leave you feeling a little scrambled, like, oh my gosh, how am I gonna remember everything? But just know that as that knowledge is coming off the screen, coming out of your books, that you are receiving it. And there's a theory called the tipping point. The tipping point is like you're pushing a rock up a hill. Ugh, studying can be hard. Ugh. There gets to be a tipping point where all of a sudden you go over the top and it gets easier. And then you've got momentum. And then if another hill, another struggle, another topic comes up, that's new for you. Maybe we talked about something today that was new for you. Um, just know that the, as you continue to just go through this, okay, that got easy. And I know for you now that there are some subjects that are easy. That's the tipping point. But that tipping point gives you momentum for the next hill that you have to get over. And it starts to make sense. And then you feel smart. At some point, you feel smart. Yeah. And then soon thereafter, you freaking pass. You pass your test. Yes. So that is our lesson for today. I'm going to go ahead and stop the share, give you guys a chance to go ahead and say hello. Yeah, feel free. All right. How's everyone doing? You know what? I'm going to go ahead and end the recording. So wave goodbye, everybody who's on. Say wave goodbye to our other students that are watching later. Bye, bye, bye. Um, so thanks so much for being uh, with us today. This ends the recording. My name again is Jody Skulls. Uh, and uh, I love uh, facilitating this space for you, holding the space for you, knowing that you are even just a baby step closer to getting your, to passing your test and getting your license to practice massage therapy. Thanks so much for being with us today. Reach out if you have questions.